this text this morning. So we want to look, you see that the, the red line is really the book of Leviticus. The more I study it, the more I look at it, the more I see the wonderful message announcing in advance all the symbolism, the sacrifice, the priesthood pointing to Jesus Christ, the bloodline from Leviticus to the blood of Jesus Christ. It's really, really wonderful. And we will see more important uh, truths from Leviticus as we close this morning. Hallelujah. Praise God. The first text, we'll go to the first slide. We read, The purpose of this rule is to stop the Israelites from sacrificing in the open fields. It will ensure that they bring their sacrifices to the priest at the entrance of the tabernacle so we can present them to the Lord as peace offering. So here this text, point number one, will be a three-point sermon. This one is very short. Uh, no more sacrificing in the wild. Like people say, okay, I want to thank the Lord, I'll do it on my, on my hillside, by the, by, under the trees. God wants God's people to congregate to come together to the place that he has chosen. And that's really important to understand even more in the New Testament. Why, why should we go to church on Sunday? Why should I wake up? Because especially in our generation, we agree that there is this strong view, this strong mentality. Oh, you have your opinions. I have mine. You have your views. I have mine. You do as you want. I do as I want. And this, this kind of mentality, not with God. This is not how God wants God's people to react. Oh, I can be a Christian by staying at home. I can be a Christian without going to church. That is not God's mind. This is not God's intention. Because God knows it's important each and every time you come to church, you are being refreshed with the vision. You know when the church makes a decision, when the church announces something, when the church organizes a mission trip, an evangelism, or any event, you flow with along with the rest of what God is doing. We are serving God's purpose in our time. We are seeking, we are finding, we are fulfilling God's vision. So we need to be part of that vision. We need to connect with that vision. You know, I, 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 it bothers me sometimes when I see some Christians, and I'm not condemning, it, it just bothers me because I, I feel sad about it. Because, you know, sometimes some Christians, they, they disappear. For a few months or a month, they are there, they are not there, they are there, they are not there. And I feel they cannot connect, they cannot be refreshed, they cannot feel. And at some point, you know it's a trap from the enemy, you feel disconnected from the family of God. People don't care, you know, either I'm there or not. It's like it, something is missing. And God is really clear on, on that. He says, why is it significant to us? What have we learned? If we, we summarize the book of Leviticus, we have already seen that the sacrifices and the priesthood points to Jesus Christ who is the perfect offering. That allows us to approach the Holy God. So because of that, we are invited to come boldly. In the New Testament, the Old Testament and the New Testament, Leviticus and the message of the New Testament really converge together in one teaching that we are invited, you are invited, I am invited to come freely, boldly, as children to the throne of grace where we can find mercy and help in our time of need. This is so clear in the book of, of, uh, of Hebrews. It's always been and will always be the desire of God to dwell among His people. That's why you see the tabernacle. You know, from the very beginning, God gave us this wonderful picture I want you to picture me in the midst of you with the, the symbolism and the, the, t the types, the prefiguration of the, the message of the tabernacle. We understand God wants to be right there in the midst of us and how to approach Him. We have seen it in much details, but it's always been and will always be the desire of God to dwell among His people. And we see the importance of coming together for worship and fellowship. And in the message of uh, Leviticus, you see that people come, but they come also with offerings. They come with their tithes. They come with their offerings. They come to say thank you. They come for communion. The idea of communion is there all the time. The fruit of our lips that confess His name. Thanksgiving, the best of our lives. When we come to church, we should come ready, prayed up, and ready to praise the Lord, ready to say thank you ready to offer something to the Lord, our ministries, our time, our service, 
so that the church can benefit and be edified. The next, if you click, Hebrew 10, 21, 25. Since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God. Let us be concerned for one another to help one another to show love. And let us neglect, let, let us not neglect or give up our habit to meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another. The message of the Vedicus, the message of the New Testament, you will see in every slide, you will see Leviticus, you will see New Testament. Leviticus, New Testament. It converged into one message. So that was for point number one, the importance of congregating the fellowship of the family of God. We have, according to the Apostle John, we have fellowship with the Father, with the Son Jesus, with the message of the Apostles, and with one another when we come together. And it's really, really important. It's important for you individually. It's important for your children. It's important for your friends. When you are not there, your friends miss you. Even, you know, like, the, the, the Christian friends are really, really important because we uplift each other, or example, or laughter, or our friendship is important. You know, many people, they choose to go to church because of their friends. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's a better goal than that, but, uh, but in spite of it, you know, our, our friends, after lunch, we get together, we go for lunch, you know, like after the service. There's something special about Christian friends to see your smile and to shake your hands and to have your hands on our shoulders. There is something special, there's something spiritual and to the, the, the physical aspect of our, of our fellowship as well. Point number two, <clears throat> as we go further in the book of Leviticus, uh, chapter 23 and, and onwards, you will find a list of the seven festivals listed uh, in the book of, of uh, Leviticus. Why are these seven festivals in uh, the Jewish calendar relevant to me today in Hong Kong in 2016? We will see a bit more about that this morning. We find seven appointed feasts. And the, the Hebrew word for these feasts, and as we begin to read chapter 23, is uh, the word for appointment. It's, it's important. It's a convocation. It's a calling, it's a festival, and God wants us to, to come to, to the, 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 the temple for that. Maybe you can show the, the, this slide, and then we, we will pay some attention to that bit. But God has seven, seven festivals that are listed over here with the months, because these festivals are in the lunar calendar, just same as a Chinese calendar, it's a lunar calendar. And uh, this corresponds to March, April, and May, June, and September, and onwards. So this is our cover, the agricultural uh, season. This is very important. You know, we, we have experienced in our generation the industrial re uh, revolutions, then the high-tech revolution that is taking over the world. But before that, it was agricultural. The whole world was living on the agriculture. So that's important to, to realize that. And, and then you, you, will, you will see the meaning of these, the Passover, the uneven bread, the first fruit, uh, the Pentecost, the trumpet, the day of atonement, and the tabernacle, or the boots. And we will see the, the significance of each of that. The three first festivals are in March, April of the year. They are called the spring festivals. The number four, Pentecost, stands in the middle of the summer, lunar calendar summer and it is a, a later harvest. And the last tree occurs in the fall, September, October. That's when the, the harvest of olives and the, uh, 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 grapes and figs are. The first one, the spring, is the first fruits of the barley, the wheat, the early, the early crops, then the midsummer, and then the, the later uh, harvest comes next. And through this festival, I want you to realize something we will see very clearly as I'm going. Maybe now, now you look at it and says, okay, how, how is it relevant to me? But I'll just, just hold on, hold on. It will come later. God gives us already early in the book of Leviticus a larger view of his calendar concerning the plan of redemption. 
because all of these feasts really correspond to Jesus Christ and really to salvation, to the message of salvation. And you will see it very clearly this morning. Let's begin with Passover. Let's go to the next slide. We'll come back to that slide later on. Leviticus 23, verse 5. The Lord's Passover begins at sundown on the 14th day of the first month, the month of Nisan, the first month of the lunar calendar for the Jews. And it is, uh, the first is, uh, Passover is a feast of redemption. You know that it's like an exodus who just left Egypt. And it is the feast of redemption through the blood of the sacrificial Lamb of God. As the angel of death, in the last place, that night in Egypt, when they were going away, as the angel of death was killing all the Egyptians, firstborn male, and every house of the land, each home of the Hebrew people that had the blood over the doors, the frames, were spared. The angel of death would not kill. And that they, this is how they were redeemed through the blood of the sacrificial lamb. The, the Jews were redeemed from the slavery from Egypt. Christians, we are redeemed from sin. Just as the blood of the lamb and the doorstep of the Jewish homes kept the angel of death away, the blood of Jesus Christ is offered as an atoning sacrifice for the forgiveness of our sins. Remember the strong message of Leviticus? Without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And we saw how the blood, there's so much blood in the book of Leviticus, but it's so important because sin is so disastrous and it does so much wrong to our life. If you click to the next one, you will see the, 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 the connections with the New Testament. Jesus himself says, you know that the Passover will take place in two days. And look at what will happen in that Passover. And the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. So you find to me, it, it touched me when I looked at that because the, look at the timeline and the real historical calendar of the Old Testament festival of Passover. That's why Jesus on the last night had a Passover meal and announced that his body was to be broken for them. And that's very significant for us today because Jesus says that in, on this calendar night, historical Passover, the Son of Man will be crucified. He will be, the, he will pay the ransom. First Peter, for you know that God paid the ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And the ransom he paid was not mere gold and silver, it was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, the spotless, the blameless, sacrificial Lamb of God. The same requirement that you found in the first five sacrifices listed in the book of Leviticus is repeated here. We are redeemed by the blood of this spotless sacrifice, sacrificial lamb of God. Those who believe in this lamb of God, Jesus Christ, will escape the spiritual death, eternal death, hell, and the judgment that God reserves to those who reject him. Passover is the most important celebration. Uh, go back to the previous uh, slide. To the, the, I just want to point something. If you notice the three first uh, uh, holiday, they are very, very much connected as we will see. You see, 14, 15 to 22, and 16. So, so they, they are all together. It's like one feast, but it's like one feast, but listed and with a separate um, element, Passover, the death of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the blood that was shed, the day that he was crucified. Then we move to the, to, to the next one, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we see that the next day, yes, on the next day, the 15th of the same month, so the 14th is Passover, the 15th, the next day, another part of the celebration of that big, huge holiday, but then with three different windows into it. You must begin celebrating the festival of unleavened bread. The festival of the Lord continues for seven days, and during that time, the bread you must eat 
The bread you eat must be without yeast. Yes. On the first day of the festival, all the people must stop their work. So that's really something special. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread is really connected with the Passover. It's the next day. And it lasts for one week. You should not eat bread with yeast. And it should cause you to remember that on that night in Egypt, the last night in Egypt, you have to leave in a hurry. So that's why you don't have time to let your bread, uh, you know, raise with the, the yeast in it. So you eat the bread without yeast to remember that last night when God delivered them and they had to, in a hurry, uh, during the night, leave Egypt and, and run away from, uh, for, the, for, the, for the salvation. Just as Israel was to remove yeast from their bread, spiritually, you and I, we are told in the New Testament the same message, we are to eat bread without yeast. Click the next one, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Take out all the old yeast, stuck into New Testament Christian, so that you will be a new batch of dough. You really are bread without yeast, Passover bread. Yes, Christ, our Passover lamb, has already been sacrificed. So let's keep celebrating the festival, but not with the bread that has the old yeast, the yeast of sin and wrongdoing. But let us eat the bread that has no yeast. This is the bread of purity, test, uh, and truth. And this is really, really important. Christ here is our Passover lamb. He cleans us with the old yeast of sin and evil. And by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells in us now that we are born again, we have to let our old lives away. So the, the feast of unleavened bread is really the old lives is away. With the, the sin, the evil, the, the yeast of, the, of sin and evil is left out of our life. It's like the symbolism of baptism. Plunge in water, the old man stays there and the new men come out to a new life of life. So that's what we, we celebrate into that. We, we really look into this, this message. And there's a context, actually, to, to that uh, First Corinthians chapter 5. How many of you know the context? What comes just before that? It's sexual immorality in the church in Corinth. And the church is still functioning. They are proud of their spirituality. They are, you know, speaking in tongues and prophesying and all the spiritual things of the church going on. And Paul is really upset. You have such a kind of sexual immorality, even worse than the world has, and you just go on praising the Lord like nothing is happening. So that's the context. And this says, a little yeast made the old dough go wrong. Yeah. Remove the yeast. That, that's, that's exactly the context. That's why it says, take, all, all, take out all the old yeast so that you will be a new a, a batch of a new dough. And, and it's just take it out. That's the context of, of that. So sexual immorality is the old yeast. And if you look a little bit further, it says, even, it says, stop associating with sexual immoral greedy, idolater, drunk, <coughs> robbers, and you know, the list. Stop associating and say, even, do not even sit to eat with that kind of people. Not, and then he makes the point, not with the, the, the <coughs> drunken of this world or the sexual immorality in the world, otherwise you could not sit with anybody ever. But for those who call themselves Christian, for those who go to, together into the fellowship of the church, you should not associate. And that's, that's a trap because sometimes we, we relate to people based on friendship more than on what God's standards are. You understand that? I think it's clear. I remember a few years ago here in Lighthouse, we had a difficult uh, decision to make and we made it. We, we expelled somebody from the fellowship based on the, that kind of sinfulness. And we have hurt a lot of people by doing that. People who were friends <coughs> with that person that we love, but that it was that serious that we had to meet uh, someone from the other organ Christian organization and ourselves and the leadership on both organizations uh, confronted that person and, and made that step. But it's very difficult to do. It's either you do it or you don't do it. 
It's either you maintain what God says, or you just don't because it's too hard, because it will hurt, because, you know, because Paul says, let that person go. Give, give that person to, to Satan's you know, working, because that, that's the choice that he has made, so that eventually, by facing the consequences of that sinfulness, he may repent, and his soul may be saved. The, the purpose of God, when and, and making such a, a blunt state uh, action, it's not to destroy, it's never, never to destroy. The ultimate outcome is that that person will, will realize, oh, what have I done? What, what, what's happening to me? I'm being expelled from the body of Christ. It's something serious. What's happening to me? So that the Holy Spirit can work, so that the prayers of people can work, so that this person can eventually repent and come back into the fellowship. A few years ago, when we started the, the French Bible study group, I had uh, made certain rules from our church clear to the group. And one of the brothers uh, broke these rules. And uh, I confronted that brother with a member of the French uh, speaking group, somebody from Lighthouse also. And I explained to that person, listen, I'm expelling you from Lighthouse. Not that I don't love you. I actually love you. And that's true. I really like the guy. And I just uh, the week before, I had taken him for lunch just to encourage him and get to know him and his life and such. He showed me photos of his family. He told me the story of his life. So it's not that I don't like him. But I says, listen, I, I'm, I'm just giving you an opportunity to reflect upon your life. Find another church and uh, realize that what you have done. Uh, you know, fix your life. And then six months to a year, I welcome you to come back. If you want to come back to the lighthouse, we will take you back. But first, you take an appointment with me, we'll discuss it, and we'll come back. So there's a way, it's not a rejection. I said, I'm not rejecting you. I wish you will learn something, and that you will make your life straight, and that you will follow God. That is very important, and we find that in the, in the feast of the Old Testament. The old, the old years, there's something important. Sometimes you, you read, how many of you have read this text in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Old Years? I don't understand that. Well, how is it relevant to me? Just go on reading and then just forget it. But it's actually a very, very clear illustration. It's an illustration to use the bread, how the, 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 the yeast and the bread raise the old dough. And if you let sin spread, then you will get the, the, the sinfulness and the old dough as well. So it's like you choose. You want the sinfulness and all your friends happy and everybody do whatever they want. Or you want to follow God and remove it serve according to God's purpose. Amen? Amen. Amen? Hallelujah. You may disagree with me if you want to. First fruit, <laughs> next one. <clears throat> Actually, for the bread, let me just finish something. There are also something very important also, that other symbolism in the bread. We, and you find that in the last supper, the night when the Jesus set out about his broken body. When you take communion, the broken body of Jesus makes us into a unity the body of Christ. So there's something blessed, there's something special in that broken body so that we form eventually one body. And another benefit of that, that by his broken body, by his stripes, you are healed, which is a very, very important statement. You come to communion, expect healing. And it's, it's right to expect healing when you come to communion and then you, you ask. Because if you really focus, when we take him in the Lord's Supper, we really focus on the broken body, the stripes, the, the, the whip, you know, and, and all the, the sufferings, the physical, the bodily sufferings of Jesus Christ. By his stripes, you were healed. So, so just take it into your, your heart and, and keep, keep this hope. First fruit. The day after the Sabbath of the same uh, holiday, when the week is over, it's one day after the Sabbath. When you enter the land and you harvest its first crop, bring the priest a bundle of grain from the first cutting of your grain harvest. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest will lift it up or wave it before the Lord so it may be accepted on your behalf as a pleasing uh, aroma. 
So the Israelites would bring a bundle of their first grain. That's why it's a spring harvest. The bar barley, usually in Canada, I know that I was working as a, as, a, as a gardener at one point in the big field with vegetables, and the first grain that comes is barley. Uh, wheat is usually a bit later. I don't know in your country what it is. Maybe you have rice instead of uh, wheat. But in Canada, barley uh, come, comes first. So you take the first grain. This is the first thing that comes up. And then you go to say thank you to the Lord. You bring it in the priest. You wave it before the Lord. And this reminds us of Christ's resurrection. If you click the next one, Christ is the first fruit. You see, all of these holidays relate directly to Christ's major event for your salvation. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep, those who died before you as Christian in the faith. So also in Christ shall all be made alive. In Christ, all, that means you and me, we will be made alive. So there is a, a promise, an assurance of a resurrection for you, the bodily resurrection. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruit, and you come next after that. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. So this is a wonderful picture. I hope you are encouraged because the Old Testament really tells you your salvation as being fulfilled according to God's calendar. It's really, really wonderful. Christ will rise first and guarantees that you in Christ will raise from the dead. Let's go to Pentecost. Pentecost, the summer harvest. Keep counting until the day after the seventh Sabbath, 50 days later. Then present an offering of the new grain to the Lord. The Feast of the Weeks, because it's seven weeks plus one day, 50 days after the first fruit festival. It's summer, it is. It celebrated the end of the grain harvest. So the first uh, harvest is finished, now we're waiting for the second, the second harvest uh, to come. The, the, the figs, the grapes, you know, all of these sorts of things. So in the Feast reminds us of the fulfillment of Jesus' promise. I think this one we all know clearly. Another helper will come who would indwell believers and empower us for the ministry. Again, if you click the next one, you will see again the historical calendar of the Leviticus being fulfilled in, in Christ through Christ. When the day of the historical Jewish calendar of Pentecost was being celebrated, all of them were together in one place, and suddenly, suddenly, the church was born, new life was given, and the coming of the Holy Spirit after 50 days after Jesus' resurrection. What a timing! It's, it's amazing. Think of just about it, just about it. The timing, the calendar, the faithfulness, the truthfulness, the symbolism that just connect the Old Testament with the New Testament. The Pentecost is a guarantee. It's an attestation of the promise of salvation and future resurrection will come uh, to pass. You know, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, that we are co heir with, with Christ Jesus of the uh, eternity. It's wonderful. But there's, there's, there's a big truth here. Uh, can you go back to the, the, the slide? Yeah, okay. Jesus died. The first fruit, uh, like uh, Jesus was buried, and we removed the old leaves. Jesus was uh, Jesus was raised from the dead. Pentecost come here. So we look to the past. Our salvation is assured. Now I want you to pay attention to that. There is a period of time here. This is like really so fast. And, and look at the crucifixion. Crucifixion on Friday, buried, and Sunday is risen from the dead. You have these, these three. Then 50 days later, the Holy Spirit comes in the calendar of God. Then there is a long period of time, months. Here you have days, here you have months. There's a period of time. It's really, really important because we see that after the spring feast ends, 
with the Feast of the Weeks of Pentecost. There is a period of time before the Fall Feast. And this is where we are right now. In the calendar of God, this is where we are in that period of time. We are what we call in the church age. Because that is when the church was born. This is the supernatural womb of God that brought the church into existence. Before that, there was no church. There was no Holy Spirit and dwelling the believers. And not only is it the church age, but also I want you to see that it is under the mandate or under the leadership of the Spirit. This is the time we are in right now. The church and the Holy Spirit must work together. The Holy Spirit must guide. Jesus Christ went to heaven. Pentecost comes. Holy Spirit, as promised, comes. And He is taking charge. And He is leading us and preparing us before the Fall Festival. Wow! Let's prepare for the Fall Festival because it's really important. You know, we're talking about finding, following, fulfilling God's purpose in our time. This message is really up to date for, for that one. Look at the calendar, look at what God has, has in mind, what He's going to do, so that we can function uh, with, with God within God's calendar. This time is a spiritually symbolic of the church age in which we live right now under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen. And just as the spring festivals point towards the mi mi Messiah's ministry of His first coming of Christ, Christ's sacrifice, burial, and resurrection, the fall feast will point toward what's going to happen in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the fall feast. Amen? Are you excited? Yes. It's wonderful, that's actually, because it tells us exactly what's going to happen. We're not there yet. We're going there. Amen? Yes. So you know where you're going. Amen? The feast of the trumpets. Leviticus. Speak to the people of Israel, saying, in the seventh month, we go to the seventh month. On the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest. A memorial proclaimed with the blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. A memorial proclaimed by the blast of the trumpet. It commemorates, commemorates the end of the agricultural year. This is the end of the agriculture, the fig, the, the everything else comes, the grapes, everything else, the olives comes, it's finished, okay, so it's a time. And I want you to really feel encouraged and refreshed with this truth because it really touched my, my heart when I read that. This is for the field workers. This blast of the trumpet to all the land announced to the workers, because as I said before, at that time, we, everybody, the whole world was agricultural. Everybody lived out of the farm and the, the grains and the, 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 the grapes and everything that was produced. And so when the trumpet blasted at this festival by God's command, it announced the end of the agricultural uh, 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 harvest, okay, the season, and it's a day of solemn rest. Th think about it. The workers have been harvesting. They have been, you know, like really working. They have been working for the first spring uh, harvest. They have been waiting for the fall harvest. The fall harvest is now finished. And the trumpet says, hey, time to rest from your work. This is for you. This is for you. You rejoice. There's a time for rest from your work. And that is what the... the, the the Testament, the Old Testament, the New Testament says, a solemn day of rest to present our friend to God. The trumpet was a signal for the field workers to come to the temple to rejoice before the God with a time of rest. That is events that are to come yet. It's not there yet. And you know, because if you've been a Christian long enough, you know the trumpet is also the rapture. And at the rapture, it's rest time finish all the, you know, the persecutions, the injustice, you know, all the, the, the things that you have been suffering, you know, the, all the hard labor that Christians have done to be faithful for the Lord. It's going to be over, and now we're going to up. 
And this is when the Lord will evaluate you and I for our faithfulness and harvesting as, as the field workers. Because this is the big truth this morning. Until we reach there, and we, are, we say our theme is to serve God's purpose in our time, you and I, we are the field workers. We are co-workers with God. It comes from different texts in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Your identity and my identity at this time is that we are meant to be involved in working in the harvest. Didn't Jesus say to his disciples in John chapter 4, Look up, the fields are white for harvest. So go and harvest. Are you harvesting? Are you involved? And that's a serious point. Maybe I'm smiling, but actually I should not be smiling because this is a very serious point because that's the reality. Until we reach the trumpet of rapture, and you can click to, to show the next, the next text on this one, then we need to be involved in the harvest. You need to bring someone into the harvest. You need to sow. It's like the parable of the talents. You have given one, five, ten, whatever you are giving. If you hide it in the ground and you're just like, oh, I would just very quiet as a Christian, not doing anything evil, I'm just, I'm just waiting. Then something is missing and to your understanding of what God is. According to what we read in the Leviticus, this is a festival announced, proclaimed by the trumpet that announced the end of the agricultural season the one that you have been working at very faithfully all of since you have been Christian to bring people into the harvest of the Lord Jesus. And now you can rest, you are going up and you are going to receive your reward. That's the wonderful message. Let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will be transformed, for our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. A solemn day of rest for the fields worker at the sound of the trumpet. The living believers at that time, who have been working in the harvest of the Lord faithfully, will cease their work, their labor, and the church will be taken up into heaven. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So exciting. This is what's coming ahead. We are in that time right leading into this, and it's for sure it is coming, because the calendar of God is very precise, as you have seen. Remember the on the day after, on the day after, on the day of Pentecost, 50 days, the calendar of God is very, very precise, and at this time, it's going to happen. Next one, Tabernacles. Again, it's a wonderful feast of rejoicing for the families. You know, the plan of God involves everybody in your family. It involves you, because you know, at those times, you know, you're really thinking about man, man, the leader. It's only about men, but it's also about the wives. You know, Elkanah went to the temple, with his wife, Anna. Anna didn't have children, but later on she had Samuel. So God in, in, involves the, the children when it's time to go to the temple. There's a spiritual leadership given to men and, and a mutual responsibility to couple in First Peter chapter 3 about uh, you know, um, supporting and encouraging mutually our spiritual life. It, it is, we are co heir of the grace of salvation, men and women. First Peter chapter 3. So here it says, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, the seventh day, for seven days the feast of the booths, live under the tent to remind the Israelites that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And this feast points toward the future when Christ will rule and reign. Amen? Amen. This is, this is what we are looking people for eternity from. Every tribe, tongue, and nation will tabernacle. That, that's the, 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 the word used. Will dwell, will tabernacle, will live in the tent uh, with Christ in the new uh, Jerusalem. If you click, <coughs> that's why I put this picture over there to 
give us <coughs> a sense of a uh, you know revelation. Even though it's it's never right to do something, it's never uh, the the real thing. He showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Look, the tabernacle of God is with men. The tent, God is dwelling. And he dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. So when you look at these seven feasts, now I think you get the idea how they are significant. This is, but they are obscure chapter in the obscure book of the Old Testament and the book of Leviticus. But when you see the fulfillment and the, the, the parallelism found in the New Testament, I think it makes a lot of sense and it is very, very rewarding for you and I to know the distance can. It is announced from the beginning of the God's plan in the book of Leviticus, as soon as God said these people, let them at the foot of Sinai and started to instruct them, and these instructions, God found that it was important that he would display these things to them. But you know, as, as I was uh, thinking this morning, a lot of the things written in the Old Testament, the prophets were studying it. You know, you read that in 1 Peter chapter 1. The prophets were investigating the things about the Messiah, the prophecies, the calendar, the promises. They were investigating about salvation, about grace. But it's, it was revealed to them that it was not for them, that these things were really written. It was for you and it was for me that, that these things become clear through the gospel, through, through Christ who came and fulfilled. He's, the, he's really the fulfilling, the fulfillment of all of these wonderful truths that we have seen uh, this morning. And I want to, to finish point number three quickly with one, we cannot not leave that one out because it's such a wonderful truth, is the Jubilee. The Jubilee is such a wonderful thing that you see. Jubilee means ram on, like you know the shofar, the, you know when they blew the, this, this trumpet over there. And the Jubilee, the chapter 25 of Leviticus, described what they call the sabbatical, the sabbatical year. Sabbatical year is a year of rest every seven years where you don't sow the field. You let the field rest. And God will provide more food miraculously. Just leave it alone. Just let it rest. And then you multiply these seven years seven times plus one year, 50 years, and then you get to the Jubilee. And the Jubilee is a wonderful uh, proclamation of uh, freedom, of liberty throughout the land. And this way you shall set the 50th year apart and proclaim freedom to all the inhabitants of the land. It shall be a jubilee to you. During this year, all property that has been sold shall be restored to their original owner or their descendants, and any who have been sold as slaves shall return to their families. Uh, and, with, and there's so much more. I'm just bringing it as you see a verse, but there's so many rules about justice about fairness in society, about how to treat the poor, how not to abuse, the, you know, how to give fair wages, and it is so rich in, in laws and regulations to take care and to show love to one another. All captives or prisoners, for whatever reasons, are set free. All slaves are released from their work because they were too poor, they sold themselves as slaves, or they sold their children as slaves. All debts were for, for forgiven, you know, they, they, they borrowed money because they didn't have something for the harvest, and all property was returned to their original owners, a time of rest for the land and for the people. And the Jubilee is the most beautiful picture of the New Testament themes of redemption and forgiveness. When Jesus, in fact, began his ministry, his public ministry, the very first thing that he did when he came back from being tempted in the wilderness in Luke chapter 4, is he used that proclamation, that reference directly to the year of Jubilee. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, recovery of the sight of the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He spoke of freedom of the prisoners. 
the release of the oppressed, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. This is the Jubilee. And he said, today, this scripture has been fulfilled. Again, Jesus fulfilled the most wonderful thing. And Jesus is so wonderful. He has saved us. He has paid all of our debts. You know, you and I, we have a huge debt. How many of you have debts in this church? Raise your hand. Oh, don't raise your hand. <laughs> if you have uh, any sorts of debts, okay, to the bank or to someone. <laughs> Some of us, we have small debts we can repay. Some of us, maybe our debts are, you know, people who are going to gambling or drinking or, you know, the, 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 in excess. Some of them, they end up not being able ever to repay their debts. This is the kind of death that you and I, we have with God. A death that nobody, actually, Jesus gives that, uh, that illustration when he talks of the Sermon on the Mount. I, I know when he talks about uh, this guy who was uh, given by, by God's mercy a, a lot of death free, and then he goes out and he finds his friend that owes him a little bit of money, and then he puts him in prison. And then Jesus says, this is how it will be when you do not forgive the debts. The word debts and the word offense is the same word used in the New Testament in this text. It's an offense because of our sin. It's a debt. It's a, if you forgive the debts, you will be forgiven. If you don't forgive the debts, you will not be forgiven. So that's as Christ has done. He has proclaimed a year of the Lord's favor. And after he's done that, he rose from the dead. Fifty days later was Pentecost. At Pentecost, it inaugurated the Jubilee. The, 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 the apostles began to preach deliverance, forgiveness, the good news that brings. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the power of God for those who will believe for salvation. So then, this mission is still the ongoing mission of the church. And that's my last point as I finish with that. We find, follow, fulfill, serve God's purpose in our generation. This jubilee, we are preaching it. We are proclaiming it. This is our mission. You want to serve God's purpose? Just just think of the Jubilee. You have experienced that. Now you are proclaiming it. This is our message. This is our mission. This is a great commission.